Hello, I'm Jim Lindsay, the director of the Robert S. Strauss Center for International Security and Law, and I'm delighted to welcome you here tonight uh, to today's talk, uh, which I can proudly say is sponsored by the John Brumley Chair in Global Affairs. Uh, the Brumley Chair was created at the Strauss Center in recognition of the fact that modern technology is a dual-edged sword. Uh, technology makes our globalized <coughs> world possible, but in the wrong hands, technology can wreak havoc. Uh, the Brumley Chair seeks to address this dilemma by supporting research and discussion on how to develop peaceful ways to ensure that technological and scientific advances do not endanger global security. The Chair is a very generous gift of John and Rebecca Brumley. Uh, John and Becky are both distinguished alums of the University of Texas. Uh, John has had a very illustrious career in the energy sector, and he is now the chairman of Encore Acquisition Company of Fort Worth. Uh, Becky is the chairwoman of the Red Oak Foundation in Fort Worth. And we are very fortunate uh, because John Brumley is with us tonight, and if you could join me in thanking John for support for the University of Texas. We are honored to have uh, tonight as our guest speaker someone whose entire professional life has been a testament to the mission uh, of the Brumley Chair, and that's Mr. David uh, Albright. Uh, Mr. Albright is one of the world's foremost experts on nuclear proliferation. He is currently president of the uh, Institute for Science and International Security, a nonprofit, nonpartisan institution he founded uh, to inform the public about science and policy issues affecting international security. Uh, before founding the ISIS, Mr. Albright worked as a senior staff scientist at the Federation of American Scientists and as a member of the research staff of Princeton University's Center for Energy and Environmental Studies. In the 1990s, uh, Mr. Albright uh, worked very closely with the International Atomic Energy Agency's action team to analyze uh, Iraq's uh, past nuclear activities. In June of 1996, he was the first non-governmental inspector of the Iraqi nuclear program. Uh, Mr. Albright has published widely on nuclear proliferation issues. He has served on numerous scientific panels and he has testified many times before the U.S. Congress uh, on nuclear issues. Now, the title of Mr. Albright's talk today is Preventing an Iranian Bomb, Sculpting Effective Acceptable Strategies. Uh, what we're going to do is uh, Mr. Albright will talk, and then we will open it up uh, to some conversation with the audience. Uh, one thing I would do before I ask you to join me in welcoming uh, David is if you have a BlackBerry, cell phone, or anything else that would uh, make sounds as a courtesy to our speaker. If you could turn them off, I would be greatly appreciated or mute them or put them on vibrate. I appreciate it very much. And having said that, please welcome me, uh, join me in welcoming David Albright. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. No, it's a great pleasure to be here today. Um, I am trained in physics, so it's always wonderful to get out of Washington and be able to talk both on the, well, bring in more of the science. Um, one of the reasons I formed ISIS is we, we actually picked the acronym and then found, sculpted the name around it. We wanted a word you could say. But we, one of the reasons I formed ISIS was that there wasn't enough, from my point of view, enough science injected into the, the policy debates in Washington. And we've, over the years, tried to fill that role. And so we tend to concentrate on the, on the more technical side of issues. And we concentrate on nuclear nonproliferation pretty much exclusively now. We've worked in other areas, other nuclear areas before, but now it's really focused on nonproliferation, what states are doing, what terrorists may do. Um, and tonight, what I'd like to do is talk about Iran, which is certainly in the news. Um, and I'd like to start with just a simple question of should we worry about Iran? Um, Certainly, you're probably familiar with the national intelligence estimate that came out in, in early December of last year. Um, 
and the headlines were quite dramatic that Iran did not, after all, have a nuclear weapons program. The Bush administration had been saying pretty consistently that it did, and then they retreated, and, and in Washington, uh, there's, and I'm, I don't know if you saw it on TV, there were all kinds of accusations that, that Bush has done it again, that the, the mishandling of intelligence, um, that they knew somehow that there was no program. And what I'd, um, what I'd like to do tonight, though, is dig deeper into that topic, um, that it's not quite as simple as Iran doesn't have a nuclear weapons program. And in fact, one of the headlines I'd like to have is, is that, that in a sense the Bush administration and the intelligence community in the United States was coming around to what most of the world had already concluded long ago, particularly at the International Atomic Energy Agency, the inspectors in Vienna, that, that a, the issue isn't a secret parallel nuclear program that could involve nuclear weapons. The issue is right in front of us. It's a declared civil nuclear program that is providing Iran with the capability to make nuclear weapons. And it was that concern in 2003 that led the European, three European foreign ministers to go to Tehran and make a deal with the representative of the Supreme Leader of Iran so that Iran would suspend its uranium enrichment program that uses gas centrifuges. And I'll talk more about it. It's at this site here called Natanz. Um, but it would suspend and enter negotiations with the European Union to see if there can be a permanent settlement where Iran would get incentives um, and, and, in tra and trade off parts of its nuclear program. And so again, in the Nas National Intelligence Estimate, they talk about the nuclear weapons program stopping in Iran in the late 2003. And, and I think to those European foreign ministers, um, it was pretty clear that Iran Iranian leadership wouldn't have sat down with them if they hadn't suspended their nuclear weapons program as well. So I think the NIE in some sense is, shouldn't be a shock. It's a, the United States uh, readjusting its analysis and facts to what a lot of the rest of the world had already come to believe. And from the European point of view, in fact, a German government official said it, um, the NIE did, did not remove the suspicions about Iran. If you read the unclassified version of the NIE, and that's all I can read, we don't carry, we actually don't carry uh, security clearances at ISIS. We, we, we want to stay outside of, of government. But if you read it, um, it's rather pessimistic about the future. I would almost say that there's an expectation that Iran will eventually get nuclear weapons that's in, that is widely shared in the intelligence community. And so you have a situation where the headline, even for the NIE, should have been more that Iran, while it stopped a nuclear weapons effort, didn't stop its ambitions. And we strongly suspect once they develop a capability to make highly enriched uranium, that they may seek to build nuclear weapons at that point. And that's important because the highly enriched uranium production is really the long pole in the tent, if I can quote one of the leaders of the effort that led to the NIE. Making the nuclear weapon itself is simpler. It's not simple, but it's simpler than putting together the capability to make the highly enriched uranium. And Iran started trying to do that in 1985, according to their own declarations. And so here it is over 20 years later, and they're still struggling to make their uranium enrichment program work. So it, they're not going to need that amount of time to make, a, to fashion that highly enriched uranium into a, a nuclear warhead that could either be launched on a crewed missile or dropped as a bomb. Let me talk a little bit about the, the program itself and go through some, some slides. Um, one of the reasons, can you hear me if I don't speak into the mic? Okay, well, uh, can you hear me if I don't speak into the mic? Yeah. All right, I'll, I'll go back and forth. But one of the reasons people were suspicious about Iran is is this right here is actually um, buried enrichment plant. And so here you had a uh, country building something underground as if it was expecting an attack. Now there's two ways to look at that. One, the Iranian view is, is that you don't care what we do, you're going to attack us. Um, we could have a civil program, you'll attack us. It could be a weapons program, you'll attack us. So they're very nervous. 
uh, on the other side, it's why do you need to build something underground if it's truly a peaceful program? And so it, it led to suspicions. And here's an earlier image, set of images, back from when we first learned about the site. Um, and you, and it, the, you can see the construction of basically what are these there are boxes in a hole. And then here what you see is covering, covering up those boxes. Down in this area, you can still see the, um, the structure that was created underground. And, and then they put on layers of, of concrete, cement, dirt. Um, to try to protect it from an attack. Um, it's a very large facility, and, and it's um, not very obvious what it is. Um, there's another facility nearby, which is even harder to figure out from, from satellite imagery. It's called the pilot plant, and that one was designed to hold 1,000 centrifuges. This one, these two were designed to hold 50,000. So it's a tremendous capability that Iran is trying to put in place. And I, I'll probably come back to this later, but this is a gas centrifuge plant. It has almost no signatures that you can see from outside. And, and so if Iran wants to build one in secret, it, it's quite capable of doing it. And other countries have done that and, and uh, been able to deceive the United States uh, quite effectively. Um, this is obviously going to be noticed by the United States as some kind of military site, and it was and it attracted a lot of interest before it became publicly known back in August of 2002. Um, Iran is making fairly steady progress. I mean, it, it's slow, because as I mentioned, it started back in the 80s. But in the last year, they've been able to go from 300 gas centrifuges to 3,000. And a gas centrifuge, let me just jump ahead. I mean, again, I don't know what you know, but um, a gas centrifuge is something that enriches uranium by by, some, by spinning very quickly. A tube spins very quickly, and, and, um, and then in that process, you can separate the isotopes of uranium. So you, you separate uranium-235 from uranium-238 and enrich. But each centrifuge only does it a little bit. It only enriches a little bit, particularly this type of, it's a very uh, old type of centrifuge. But it enriches a little bit, and it produces only a little bit. Uh, of enriched uranium at a, at, at a time. And so you have to hook them together into what are called cascades, where you have centrifuges in lines connected together by pipes. And so you can then get the enrichment level up and the quantity. And Iran um, um, put in about 18 cascades in its underground halls. So by our standards, it's not very much or very many. And, and as I mentioned, they want to have 50,000 eventually. But one of the complexities of this situation is that 3,000 is enough to make uh, about one bomb's worth of highly enriched uranium in a year, let's say. Maybe later, maybe sooner, um, but it's, it's roughly enough for a bomb program. Long before, it's actually enough for a civil program. I mean, they, almost, they need 50,000 centrifuges of this type spinning underground to produce enough what's called low enriched uranium to f meet the annual needs of a light water reactor, which is what they claim they need natans for. And so one of the dilemmas facing the international community is, is that long before they have this civil capability in hand, they're going to have a bomb capability. And when you add in that there's been suspicions, Iran misled inspectors when they finally let the inspectors come to this, these sites. Um, the Europeans decided that let's ask Iran to suspend. And again, they assumed no bomb program ongoing, but it was enough what they saw in front of them to say it's time to, to ask Iran to suspend. And they succeeded for a couple years. Um, the suspension broke down 2000 and five and six, and, and, it, and things haven't been going very well since. Um, and I'll come back to that. Let me just show you one photo. This is the pilot plant from a ground photo. When President Kantami was in power, he brought journalists to this site. And, they, and, they, and these photographs are from some of the, the journalists. Uh, no, I know US, I'm not sure US journalists were allowed in. But again, this is a very nondescript building. But this is a building that can hold 1,000 centrifuges. I should mention um, that the United States could, could destroy this site. I mean, a box in a hole is not very 
robust against U.S. armaments. I mean, it's not clear. Israel may struggle with its bunker busters, but I think if, with multiple strikes, it could do it. Um, but these, these facilities can be destroyed, and I think Iran understands that now. And in fact, I mean, recently, um, they started to build new facilities in a mountain adjacent to Natanz, and they've done this before. So in a sense, they're always thinking of a military strike as a possibility, and they build for that. And so, I mean, they can't see much of these images, I apologize. But here, here's, they, um, they were putting together, so it looks like a tunnel entrance here, and there's another, and it, there's one on the other side of the mountain. Let's see, which way do I go? Oops. Well, anyway, this, this will show it enough. It, in this area, there's an underground facility that could be to hold, they call it strategic goods. I mean, the inspections, and I'll make this point over and over again, the inspections by the International Atomic Energy Agency have been weakened in Iran. They were weak to begin with, then they got strengthened, and then Iran weakened them again. And so during the strengthened period, the, the IA could have gone into this tunnel complex and asked what's going on. Now they can't. And so it just remains a mystery of what the purpose is. But, I, but it, it certainly um, shows you that Iran plans for attack. Um, let me talk briefly about another facility. This is a, called the Esfahan Uranium Conversion Facility. And it's a, it was built with Chinese help. It's very large. It's sized for a civil program. Um, it was the first facility Iran opened at, during the, at, when it ended the suspension. And it started making it's called uranium hexafluoride at this site. It's the feed gas for the centrifuge program. It's absolutely vital. And for those who were thinking of military strikes, this was the, the one main bottleneck in their nuclear program. It's not anymore. They've made something like th over 330 tons of uranium hexafluoride so far. And you only need 5 to 10 tons of this natural uranium hexafluoride to produce enough weapon-grade uranium for a bomb. And so, and, and also near that facility, uh, they built a tunnel complex, which is up in here. And this one the IA did visit. Um, they actually, IA used commercial satellite imagery like this to find out that it was going on. They then asked Iran what's going on, and they said, oh, Iran said, oh, we forgot to tell you, we're actually doing something nuclear related in this facility. You know, come on over and you can look. And again, this was to store um, ur uranium hexafluoride equipment, things like that. But again, it's it, 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 um, hard to destroy these kind of sites. This shows a, just a closer, another vision, view of the, of the tunnel complex. This one is a little later, and they now have three, three tunnel entrances, and the facility underground stretches around like this. <clears throat> another facility, um, which is fairly easy to see in satellite imagery. It's a little hard in this image. But there's heavy water production plant here. And this was picked up by the inspectors by the United States long ago. Um, you could see it being built. It has very distinctive characteristics, um, very tall towers. And, and it means that, that it, Iran wants to build a heavy water reactor. That's why you would make heavy water. And, and sure enough, over the years, it's appeared next door. It's in this, this area here. And so that's in 2004. <clears throat> Here's in 2006. You can see two images of it. Uh, the central, the cylinders where the reactor itself would go in. And then here, here's some ground shots of the uh, heavy water production plant. Now I should say that Iran is not. Um, succeeding very well at enrichment. It's, it's operating these 3,000 centrifuges, but it's not operating them very well. It, the origin of the centrifuge is actually European. It's a Dutch model that this Pakistani named A.Q. Khan stole. He was a spy for Pakistan in the 70s. He stole this design, brought it to Pakistan, duplicated it. Um, it never worked that well. He also stole another design, a German design. Uh, which was much better, and as soon as he could make that German design, which is harder to make, he then replaced all these old, what he calls P1 centrifuges. He had an, 
um, a desire to make money. He also had a, had a very anti, well, still does, a very anti-Western grudge. He then started to sell these centrifuges in the 1980s, and one of his first customers was Iran. But he tried in other places. He tried to sell to Iraq, tried to sell Iraq help on making nuclear weapons in October of 1990, right after um, Iraq had invaded Kuwait and was understanding that it's probably going to, good chance it's going to get invaded by the United States. He was willing to step in to offer um, Iraq help on, a, on, on building a nuclear weapon and also centrifuge designs. But Iraq had actually acquired their own centrifuge designs and didn't need that. But they did need the bomb design. Fortunately, the war uh, stopped that deal. But it, and there were many other offers. But Iran was the first customer, and it, and it bought these P1 centrifuges and then has tried to duplicate them. And it's, and it's run into trouble, one, because it's not a very good centrifuge, two, because uh, they're, they're not as good as the Dutch. And the Dutch have finally abandoned the centrifuge, too. Uh, it lost out in a competition to the, the German design, that time called the G2. Um, you can watch how well the centrifuge operates through what the inspectors do. And, and we track it, and it's, this information is on our website. Um, it should be working much better by now, but it's not. And that's one of the reasons why you see these estimates in the National Intelligence Estimate, and we do them too, where Iran isn't that close to being, having the capability to make highly rich uranium. It's going to have to overcome some problems. Um, but it is slowly making progress. I mentioned number of centrifuges increased tenfold. Number of centrifuges enriching uranium increased tenfold in a year. We're now just watching to see if they can get the enrichment or the amount of enriched uranium up over the next year to see if they can make these centrifuges work better. Um, Iran recently told the IA that it doesn't plan to add any more P1 centrifuges to the underground site, that instead it'll concentrate on trying to make them work better. Um, because the IA inspections are relatively weak now, there is a worry that, that um, they could build a plant, a P1 plant in secret, that the traditional, what we call traditional inspections had a major flaw in them. Namely, they weren't very good at detecting undeclared nuclear activities. And they were fixed, and that, that fix is what Iran rejected. And, and even though it had accepted it for a while. And so Iran is in a position to duplicate what they did at Natanz, perhaps in a building on the surface, probably more likely on the surface, because it attracts less attention than digging a hole in the ground. And they could, they could replicate this facility. And so it's in this, in this discussion with Iran, it's very important that, that the inspections be strengthened. And that is certainly on the, on the agenda of the Europeans, but things are going so badly now that it's, it's, uh, it's getting lost. The other thing Iran recently was reported to have said is that it's going to bring a more advanced centrifuge to Natanz. And this, again, this is the P2, what the Pakistanis call the P2, which is this German machine. And they've been developing it, again, in secret. They developed it earlier to a certain point. And they're they've been developing it in secret for the last two years. Um, and now they're going to do some tests soon at, at Natanz. And this one has people worried because it is a much better centrifuge. And if they learn how to work it properly, then they could actually increase, if they can build the machine, then they can increase their level of enrichment output. It's also around did something. It, the P2 is, again, I apologize for the technical detail. I know there, there must be some technical people here. It, the P2 is made out of Mirajian steel. It's a, um, a two. It's actually very similar to this. I, I, sorry to go all the way back. Um, it's very similar to this centrifuge. Um, and so it has, this, in this model, it has, these are two independent rotor tubes connected together by what's called a bellows, which is a very thin rodging steel part that's very hard to make for the P2. Iran said it can't make it. It can make the, uh, a simpler bellows for the P1, but it can't make this. So what it did is it cut the design in half, so it's only run rotor tube, but used a more advanced material called carbon fiber. And what happens with carbon fiber is it can spin faster, and so this one rotor tube uh, carbon fiber uh, machine has the enrichment output of, a, of this P2. And so they've, they've learned how to do that, which was a, a surprise to begin with, 
but when it, when the suspension started, they hadn't learned how to make uh, a, a good P2 rotor out of carbon fiber. It just didn't work. Now it appears they may have succeeded. So these two years they have, since the suspension ended, they have been learning. So again, it's something to watch for. And a lot of these things should come out around February 20th when the IA releases another report. And we should know more. Now I talked earlier about, am I talking too long? Um, talked earlier about how long could it take Iran to have enough highly rich uranium for a bomb, assuming it was going to do that. And, and the national intelligence estimate is, is actually quite uncertain about that. Um, if you look at it, it talks of anywhere from late 2009 past 2015. And I think it, it represents the uncertainty of gauging Iranian progress on mastering the centrifuge. Uh, we've done worst case estimates, um, and we would say not before 2009, probably later. Uh, it's hard to understand the 2015 number, frankly, given the IA data. But that's partly why we want to watch closely what, what Iran is able to accomplish over the next year at Natanz in the P1s. It could turn out that they just don't learn how to do it, uh, which also makes the P2 more controversial, because if they learn how to make the P2 work, then, then they may be able to accelerate f relative to 2015. But I think the general sense is, is that there is time to deal with this diplomatically. It's not a lot of time. And for the Israelis, they don't measure time to the first or enough highly enriched uranium for a bomb. They measure time to when Iran masters the centrifuge. And so their estimates tend to be sooner. Um, the head of their intelligence agency today or yesterday uh, testified in front of their Knesset and said that Iran could have a bomb in three years. And so again, they tend to not only measure a different quantity competence, but they also tend to see the bomb happening sooner. And I mention Israel because in a way, as the th I think as the threat that the United States may attack Iran has gone down, the threat that Israel may attack Iran hasn't. And, and people are just watching to see what Israel may do. That if it, it views Iran as an existential threat and, and, it, and, um, and it may calculate that it's worth it. it. It attacked Syria recently. I mean, it's happy to answer questions about that later. Um, but they attacked Syria. In that case, no one said anything. Syria was pretty quiet. Israel kept the secret, and the United States didn't want it out. Um, certainly, that I'm sure in attacking Syria, they were sending a signal to Syria, but also probably to Iran. Um, and so, it also it opens this door whether whether Israel may still attack even if the United States is unlikely to at least during this administration. Let me um, illustrate some of the problems of the, of the inspectors and then talk about some of the uh, solutions. They tend, unfortunately, in these technical, quasi-technical talks, they, the solutions tend to get buried at the end and you run out of time. But um, we can, I'll, I'll mention some things and then, and then leave it. If you want to talk about that, I'm happy to and happy to listen to your ideas. Um, let me show you one of the problems faced by the inspectors. Um, the, one of the facilities Iran didn't admit to was called Kalai Electric. And that, that means in Farsi, uh, electric goods. So it's actually a code name turned out to be a very important centrifuge research and development site. It's right here. Here's the main road. It's kind of in these nondescript buildings. So this is where in the late 90s, Iran, early 2000s, Iran learned how to start enriching uranium in these P1 centrifuges. And, and I won't go into the whole story, but it was very hard to find this site. Um, and Iran was going to try to keep it from the agents, uh, International Atomic Ener Energy Agency. They found it nonetheless. And, they, and then Iran said, well, it's just a watch factory. Maybe we made some centrifuge parts here, but no big deal. The IE wanted to use one of its tools, basic tools called environmental sampling, which is basically you take a clean cloth and swipe a surface, <coughs> excuse me, and, and then analyze it for minute traces of, of enriched uranium. Iranians said no. Uh, there was a political battle that lasted about five, six months. 
Iran had to concede. This is back in the summer of 2003. They let the IA do the swipe samples, and sure enough, all kinds of enriched uranium samples come up. And then Iran confesses. So it's, it's conf it, it, through the, in the fall of 2003, it made major revelations about its secret program. The next thing that came up, um, well, in early 2004, well, no, even in the fall of 2003, um, the United States intelligence community told the IA that there was a facility in Tehran, near Tehran, or in the suburbs of Tehran, that had imported some nuclear equipment. And this was suspicious. And the IA should ask about it. They were thinking about it. And as they were, the site started to disappear. So here's in August, and then here is in March, and then by May it was that. And, um, and, and this is, I think, I, we learned about it in, I think, March, April or May, I can't remember. Um, but we, we released the imagery with ABC New, the nightly news show, whatever that's called. Um, and the IE still hadn't asked Iran about, about the site. I, and it, we, our release of this forced, well, actually became an excuse for them to ask Iran. And Iran then said that, you know, nothing happened here. Um, there was a facility called the Physics Research Center, which, yes, you know, did buy equipment. It turned out from a cooperating company in Germany, they found out they actually bought a lot of equipment. Um, and, it, and it looked like it was for a centrifuge program. And, and this um, issue actually remains. And hopefully it'll be, it's being settled by Iran now, but it's one of the outstanding issues of what, just what did the Physics Research Center do and why did you rip down this facility? The official story um, was that this city of Tehran, which has this park here, wanted this land back, demanded the land back from the military. This is a military uh, defense industries organization. And the defense industry organization had to tear down their buildings and give it back to the city so it could be converted into some soccer fields. So this is as the site as it is now. And so um, still don't know what's going on. But again, I just wanted to illustrate that this is a current issue that, that's outstanding. And also, it's the lengths Iran has gone to to try to disguise its activities. And that's part of the reason why people remain suspicious about what Iran intends, intends in the long run. Uh, the NIE doesn't have much to say on, on Iran building a covert enrichment plant or how Iran may seek nuclear weapons. I mean, I, I'm going to skip over some of that. But it just remains a mystery. And then, as I said before, there's kind of this pessimism that eventually Iran will use these, what are now called civil facilities, to make the material for nuclear weapons. Let me wrap up by talking a little bit about um, the current situation. If there's questions about the military option, I'm happy to go into it. At ISIS, we decided on a, for various reasons, mostly from assessing their capabilities, that it doesn't make sense to attack them militarily. Whether it's a small attack or a large attack, you're not going to wipe out their capability. And you may very well start a, a pretty serious war. And so we're, we've taken the position for quite a while that we're against military strikes. I think that's less of an issue now um, after the NIE, but happy to discuss it more later. Um, but let me summarize the situation and then, and then offer some hope. Um, the inspections, as I mentioned, are weak, so you can't exclude that Iran is building secret facilities. Um, there is a, something called a work plan which the IA negotiated with Iran last summer, where Iran said, we're going to tell you the answers to all these outstanding questions, one of which I mentioned with Lavazan. There are several others, um, and they're, they're supposed to answer. So the historical view of Iranian program should be better. Iran's going to proclaim that as a major accomplishment and expect a lot for it. Um, there's worries that the IA isn't actually pursu pursuing the questions as, as, as aggressively as they should be or pursuing all the questions they should be asking. Um, I mentioned several times the suspicions about Iran's intentions remain high. Um, the, the NIE had an 
uh, a short-term effect of actually energizing the hardliners. In a sense, confrontation gets you a victory. And Iran quickly declared the NIE a victory. I mean, it's easy to make fun of them because they, they said, yeah, you t said we don't have a bomb program. We love that. We, nowhere in the Iranian press did you see where the, the national intelligence estimate said there had been a bomb program prior to late 2003. So the actual NIE was not publicized in Iran, just the part that, that they liked. Um, I mentioned this idea of a suspension. There's little, right now there's little optimism to get a suspension, which is to sh get the, pro the centrifuges to shut down and then have a negotiation. The U.S. position is no negotiations unless there's first a suspension, and the Iranians say there won't be any suspension. Um, the U.N. Security Council is starting to take up its third resolution. It had two that ratcheted up the sanctions a little bit. Prior to the NIE, the Europeans were very hopeful the sanctions could be ratcheted up quite a bit, particularly financial sanctions. Those are actually turning out to, to be painful for Iran. And, uh, and, and it's, it is hurting the prospects of their economy. Um, after the NIE, the, the third sanction bill or resolution is pretty, pretty weak. Um, and its prospects aren't that great. But nonetheless, um, the, the Security Council will probably pass it over the next several weeks. But it won't, it's not significant pressure that's uh, going to, in the short term, I think, change any Iranian position. So what to do? I mean, in December, um, I give quite a few speeches on Iran. I think I was optimistic that, not optimistic, but I felt that it was possible that the Bush administration could launch a diplomatic effort. There are people in the administration who've, who really do want to negotiate with Iran. Um, from my point of view, they'd have to drop their condition of negotiations only if Iran suspends. But there's always fancy ways diplomats can find a solution. Um, and, that, and, that, and the U.S. would still look like it's meeting its condition, but Iran would be negotiating with the United States and the Europeans while, or let's say on an interim basis, while there was no suspension. The U.S. goal, from my point of view, should be suspension. Um, I don't think it helps to freeze their program. As I mentioned, 3,000 centrifuges is enough for a bomb program. And so uh, if you just let them operate 3,000 and learn to become quite uh, proficient at it, then, then they, you worry that they'll, at, whatever, at the point of their choosing, decide to use that or a clone, clone facility to make the material for a bomb. But I think, but it, while I was in, I think, somewhat hopeful in December, I've kind of given up. Um, and it's really unlikely the Bush administration will do much of anything. I, I hope I'm wrong, and, and it, everyone is welcome to offer an opinion. Um, I don't worry as much about an attack by the Bush administration. I mean, I, again, could be wrong about that, uh, but we can discuss that. Um, I mentioned I worry about Israel. The, um, and I don't, and the, the candidates, I think, take Iran seriously, but I don't think they've solidified any, any clear opinions. I mean, it's so political now that it, it's really they're speaking to a base, and, and they're saying what that base wants to hear. I mean, the, I mean, the Democrats clearly want to negotiate more, step up the negotiation, whether, you know, whether the president will meet with Ahmadinejad or not. I mean, those are minor points um, compared to wanting to negotiate. On the Republican side, you tend to hear more uh, comments about attacking Iran. Um, and so, but I think both, whoever wins the election is going to have to wrestle with Iran. And when they do become president, the situation could be more urgent in the sense that Iran would have had this much more time to learn how to operate the centrifuges and to, and to not only learn how to operate them, but build up institutional momentum, which actually makes it harder to stop the program. So I think I'll, I'll leave it at, or I'll end on that note, and then happy to take your questions. Um, David, you uh, and your organization have justifiably received a lot of commendation for the work you've done. Uh, I think we all agree that if a little more hard data would have fallen to every policymaker's life, it would be highly desirable. But I'd like to bring back your attention to some of the soft data. And that is, uh, has to do with Iranian security perceptions and the strategic environment in which Iran thinks about its own security needs. Uh, 
whatever the, the value of the non-proliferation regime, I think if we review the sort of history, we recognize pretty soon that every country that has had, by some reasonable standard, an objective basis for building a nuclear weapon has either done so or has taken steps to do so, and steps that did not along a path that did not proceed uh, further along only because it was able to satisfy those security needs otherwise. Uh, that being the context from the background, you look at Iran, it seemed to me there's an overwhelming case to be made within Iranian policy circles to not denying itself the nuclear option. Mm -hmm. It is surrounded by the United States, which has bases in the Gulf, in Afghanistan, in Kyrgyzstan, and we are making plans to remain permanently in military terms in Iraq. It has nuclear neighbors in India, Pakistan, sort of Russia, uh, Israel, as well as the only present U.S. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's anybody in this room or anybody in the foreign policy community who role-playing and putting themselves in the position of policymakers or in the Guardian Council or elsewhere in Tehran would reach the conclu uh, any conclusion other than that they should proceed in such a way as to keep the nuclear option open. If we accept that logic, then it seems the only reasonable alternative we have, as we suggested, to engage the Iranians in a comprehensive strategic dialogue of the sort they proposed twice to us. And on two occasions, the Bush administration, the second time was in April of 03, and on both occasions, the Bush administration told them to go to hell. Uh, and I say this is a view which is shared by almost every expert knowledgeable about Iranian affairs, whether in Washington or anywhere else in the Middle East or in, uh, in a war, war in West Asia. I might just last comment. Uh, you know, I'm interested on this. I mean, somebody who has been writing about is a gentleman called Alain Chouet, a Frenchman, who recently stepped down as deputy director of the DGSF, the French more or less equivalent of the CIA, who was head of counterintelligence. He was trained and has a doctorate in Persian and Arabian studies and writes frequently on this uh, as a detached observer now in both sort of French sort of and, and English and makes a very persuasive case, more systematic, more systematic, at least available in print, because the case being made by experts elsewhere are largely people who are not in a position to do so. Actually, Jim, you might be an ideal person to I have get. to kindly ask you to come okay, to the question so we can the have The question is, <laughs> what do you think the prospects are for the United States reaching the conclusion that only a comprehensive strategic negotiation uh, with Iran is likely to achieve American strategic purposes? Well, I think in the next administration, I think they will reach that conclusion. I think even, I think even uh, not all the Republicans, but I think they're, they'll be driven toward that. Um, it's a it's a sore point. I mean, the Europeans went in with in positive incentives, offers of all kinds of energy assistance, nuclear power reactors. The U.S. threw stones at it when the Europeans went in. That was their reaction, and uh, and Iran was looking for some kind of security assurance. It didn't want to sh permanently end its nuclear option, and then have the United States out of it, threatening to. Uh, destabilize or destroy the regime. And so, in that sense, the European offer was doomed as long as the U.S. stayed out. Eventually, the U.S. started to come in, but it was, it's been a, like too little too late. And, and I think Iran um, feels stronger now than it did in 2003, 2004. And I think they're, they're going to hold out for quite a bit. And, and I agree with you completely that they, they have a reason to seek a nuclear option. I mean, no one, no one disagrees with that. Um, I think that that's, that's clear. But, but you can change a country's behavior. And countries, particularly if you can deal with security issues, I mean, you could look at countries like South Africa or the kind of the competition between Argentina and Brazil that, that used to exist that led to unsafeguarded nuclear programs. So I think you can, um, you can do it. but. And, and as I said earlier, I was hopeful in December that maybe with the shock of the NIE in the U.S. political system that the Bush administration would launch some effort, but they haven't. 
and now one of their chief people, Nick Burns, has said he's leaving. So it's not even clear who's going to deal with Iran once he leaves. I mean, someone obviously will. Uh, in the st he's in the State Department. But, but yeah, I think we're just in a holding pattern right now. But I think a lot's been learned, and I hope that the next president is more willing to do what you're talking about. All the uh, secondary nuclear powers in the world, or most all of them, that uh, have a man we, the United States has managed to get along with their getting the bomb, and has also, in many cases, been responsible or permitted them to get the bomb. Israel got the bomb. We didn't say anything. They got sub rosa help from the uh, American Jewish community and from uh, thefts that we turned a blind eye to. Uh, the Pakistanis stole all the money they needed for the bomb from us, and we turned a blind eye to the Pakistanis, and we turned a blind eye to their helping the North Koreans. Um, and uh, we didn't say jack to the South Africans when they tested their bomb and Israel's bomb out in the uh, Indian Ocean. So uh, why is the United States really all that dreadfully concerned about Iran getting a bomb now? Is it uh, any sort of honest effort? on the part of the United States to uh, control nuclear proliferation, or is it more just the uh, United States uh, wishing to extend its control of the uh, Middle Eastern oil supply? Um, the, the U.S. efforts on proliferation or non-proliferation have been mixed. I mean, you're, you're pointing out cases where it failed. They, they clearly set a, another priority ruled in Pakistan, other than stopping Pakistan's bomb program. They could have stopped it if they'd wanted to. Um, it, would, it wouldn't have been easy, but they didn't want to because they were worried about what was going on in Afghanistan in the 80s. And so, and then in the 90s, there were other things that happened, um, but it's always harder to stop a program once they have nuclear weapons. But the policy of the United States has been to stop proliferation, that proliferation is not good for U.S. security. There's all kinds of exceptions, and you mentioned some, but you, you didn't mention Taiwan, which the U.S., they stopped their program twice. South Korea was stopped. South Africa, certainly the United States, actively worked uh, very hard to change the security environment in Southern Africa during the Reagan administration and the first part of the Bush administration to, to solve the, the, the problems that were, were affecting South Africa. And I could go on. Um, there are many countries that have stopped their program. Um, now, why do we care about Iran? Now, again, I mean, the Bush administration divides up the world in friends and enemies much more than other administrations have done. And, and Iran is an enemy. I mean, it was a part of the axis of evil. So for the Bush administration, that's sufficient, that a, a bomb in the hands of the Iranians would threaten U.S. security across the board. It would create instability. Iran would probably be more assertive in the region, <clears throat> empowered with its nuclear weapons. It would, in a sense, use it politically. And, and you would worry about the spread of nuclear technology under the civil, civil guise uh, into Arab countries. So I think, and some of those I agree with, some I don't. But, it, but the bottom line is, is that it's hard to think of a case with these, in these regions of tension where proliferation has helped the situation. And so from my point of view, you, proliferation should be stopped. Um, but again, not militarily, because I don't think it works. I mean, I lived in Israel in 1981 when the Osiric reactor was bombed. And, uh, and there was general celebratory oh, celebration but, I, but there were many people who worried, and they were right in the end. What happened, Israel, I'm sorry, Iraq, just decided that it now had an excuse to go secret and, it, and, and an excuse and, and a reason, actually, to ramp up the size of the program and to make it much more focused. And, and if, Iran, if Saddam Hussein had invaded Kuwait in 1990, Iran would be, Iraq would be sitting on a lot of nuclear weapons now. So I think it, it's... Uh, uh, so I, I, and I, and in terms of U.S. interests in oil, I mean, I, others should speak to that. I mean, I, I, I'm a proliferation expert. I'm a scientist. I, I can't really respond to that. Uh, the point in there, in your answer, uh, where would Iraq have gotten the fissile material for any bombs? Uh, because they don't have any uranium deposits. No, they have, they have lots of uranium. No, they extract it from phosphates. They were building a centrifuge program, what's called an electromagnetic isotope separation program, using we call them calutrons. So they, they were pursuing, they pursued gaseous diffusion for a while. 
uh, they were making the most progress or the best program for them was the gas centrifuge and they were getting lots of help from Europeans particularly some German gas centrifuge experts um, and in fact that's one thing I didn't talk about it very much but most of these programs that I'm we focus on at ISIS depend on foreign assistance it's not it's not deliberate in most cases by governments it's it's illicit called illicit nuclear trade they extend they depend on it extensively Khan from Pakistan was so upsetting because he was another player who was willing to provide highly classified information and expertise about gas centrifuges and about nuclear weapons design for money and so in that sense he's he's everybody's nightmare and and um, but still, these countries do depend on foreign assistance. And that's, I, I don't want to go into it here very much, but we need to find ways to better stop this kind of illicit nuclear trade. Well, in this regard, could you comment on the Russian role uh, over the history to some extent? But what do you see the future of the Russian role in Iran? They, on, on balance, they've been pretty helpful uh, to the Europeans. I mean, it's hard to believe that if you read the newspaper. But they, but they, they do see Iran. Um, with a nuclear weapon is a big problem. But they, they have real financial interest. In well, that's that's the other side of it for Russia. They want to sell nuclear power reactors, um, but but right, and the way this has worked is it's okay if Iran has nuclear power reactors, and the U.S. blessed that again with allow of sort of signing off on Russia providing the low, the fresh low enriched uranium for Bushir. I mean, two years ago that would have been unheard of, so that there have been shifts in position. Um, in fact, I remember back in 2003, a very senior State Department official told me that, you know, Natanz is not near the threat uh, as the Bushir power reactor, in the sense that a lot of people in the administration believe they could harvest the plutonium um, and build a bomb with that. David, just a quick follow-up. Could you explain why that change occurred? Because I assume the physics of using Bushir to build nuclear weapons hasn't changed or, or has it? No, no, no. One, the one thing Russia said was it's going to take the spent fuel out of Iran eventually. I think what it was is that, that there, there, this, this reactor cost, I think it cost the Iranian $2 billion because they paid a lot of money to the Germans to, build, to start building it, and then they paid again about a billion to Russia to, to, to build the, the Russian reactor inside the, the German facilities. And, um, and there's a sense if you produce, if you spend that much money to produce electricity, you're unlikely to divert it, which means losing that facility. They won't get any more fuel from Russia, and they depend on Russian fuel. So I think the, the sense is that in the you know, five to 10 year period, the re reactor doesn't pose that much threat. Um, and, and if Iran gives up its uranium enrichment program and converts over to a a program that you see in Taiwan or South Korea where there's a, there aren't these fuel cycle activities, uh, on a, particularly on enrichment, um, then, then it's fine. Now, the, why it switched, I mean, it's, it was very complicated, and, and uh, I can't name who. I mean, certainly Condoleezza Rice became the front person, but there was a transition in the administration. But, I, but from my point of view, it was unfortunately um, not soon enough. How long do you think Israel would like I don't know. I mean, there's a, it's really, I, th I think the, I don't think they want to attack in the election season. I mean, whatever that means. I mean, <laughs> September, October, November. I mean, from their point of view, the way when they, they, in Washington, the way the Israeli government officials talk is the strike needed to happen by this July. That, that was their, kind of their deadline. And of course, they didn't want to do it. They wanted the U.S. to do it. And, uh, and the U.S. was thinking of, you know, some of the more moderate people who you wouldn't think would support military strikes were thinking about it because if Israel does it, my God, the U.S. will be blamed and we'll, be, we'll face the retaliation. Um, and so we might as well join in because we can do it much better. Israel, it's like, I, I, it's like pinpricks. Um, let me show this real quick. I mean, this is a Google Earth image of just some of the nuclear facilities in Iran. Um, this is we're talking about the um, Iraq reactors here, the heavy water plant. The Tan enrichment plant is here. Um, Lavazan was up here. Kalai Electric. These are the suburbs of northern Tehran. Um, this is a really represents current research. This is these are pl 
places where we suspect centrifuge components were made prior to the suspension. And that's one of the real issues on the military strikes is you could knock out an Atans, um, but let me see if I can zero in on this. Um, these aren't, uh, let me say, this, we're not sure these are the actual places, but I'm just going to show you as an illustration. Um, let's see, is this one better? This is one of the dilemmas you face is that there are a lot of complexes in Iran that look like this. This one's out in the country. They're also in the city. Um, and let me, again, I'm not, not totally convinced this is the right place, but it's similar to the right place where, where Iran made very sensitive parts of the centrifuge. They were called the rotating parts of a centrifuge for the P1. And, it's, and this is a lot of buildings here. It's one tiny part that made the centrifuge components. It's actually, these facilities are often dedicated to making military equipment, missiles. The one where the centrifuges were made uh, was at a missile production plant. And just, but one very small part of it. And so we don't know where they make the centrifuge components now. The IA lost the ability um, to know that. And so they could be making them anywhere. And if you don't destroy the centrifuge manufacturing complex, it's fairly easy to replicate centrifuges and then put them someplace else. So it's a big, big challenge, actually, to, to, to attack Iran and to have confidence that you've actually set the program back several years. I mean, obviously, the uranium conversion facility in Atans, Iraq, would, could be destroyed quite easily. But even those, those are fairly large places. Why did you take advantage of your offer earlier to tell us what you know about the attack on Syria? And specifically, was it more of a military purpose or was it more of a uh, shot across the bow political purpose? Yeah. Um, let me see something. <coughs> yeah, it's very, I mean, we didn't, we don't have a stake in this fight. I was explaining this to Alan. I mean, we, we were in, intrigued when it became public that Israel had attacked Syria. Um, and we just wanted to know what the target was. The, um, we didn't, we opposed any Israeli attack on a nuclear facility. Um, the, uh, and so if it was nuclear, we wanted to know that that was the case. Uh, to cut a long story short, we spent weeks looking at things, iterating things with sources in the Israeli government or in the U.S. government. Um, and we narrowed down uh, the region where this place was, but it was too big to find. I mean, and we didn't even know what it was. I mean, the Israelis will say it's not a, you know, it's not chemical weapons, it's not missile, it's not conventional. Like, and they, they kind of point you toward nuclear, but they don't say any more than that. Um, and you're, you're sort of stuck, and you don't even know if that's true. Um, but then the New York Times, the Washington Post, started to report there was a nuclear reactor. And we decided, okay, and we collaborate quite often with journalists from those two papers. And we were working with the Washington Post at that time, trying to get more information, look for the site. And we said, okay, let's look for a nuclear reactor. And what we did is we found this site. It's on the Euphrates. It meets all the criteria that we, we, we knew at the time. There were other sites we rejected. We looked at hundreds of sites. We looked at 2,000 square kilometers of imagery. And, uh, and we ended up with this one likely site. Um, I knew that I, uh, I, I knew the I-8 found the same site. They, they had recently acquired the same type of imagery we had. They found the same site, but still we didn't know what it was uh, for sure. I mean, it looked promising. So we actually gave the photos to the Washington Post and they took them to their sources and did their work and came back that this was the site attacked and it was a nuclear reactor. Now, if you look in the New Yorker this week, Seymour Hirsch vehemently disagrees with that. Um, he's used, he's quoted me extensively in that piece, or exten I shouldn't say extensively, many times. Um, I would argue that he's taking my, some of my statements out of context. Um, we don't agree with him. I mean, we, we, we don't, what, we're, what we see is, it's odd that if this isn't a reactor, how did we find it by looking for a reactor? I mean, that's one of the, I mean, that's not evidence, but it's, it's, it makes us pause. 
um, that if it's either one of the greatest coincidences or that this is some evidence that it could be a reactor. I say could. Um, now, why is that important? Right, what Seymour Hersh is attacking is, is that reporters who go to on, uh, what are they called, off the record sources, they may be very senior, and in this case they are. Israel only briefs senior people, starting with President Bush. The bureaucracy does not know the details of this case. It was, it's been kept very tight. But that's what got us into trouble on Iraqi WMD. Senior officials in, off the record telling reporters what's going on. So Hirsch is reacting to that. Others are reacting to that, too. Um, and, but, I, but in working with the Washington Post, I would say the post, one of the Post reporters I worked with most closely on this is the same one I went to in September of 2002 to say the aluminum tubes are not just for centrifuges. So I, I do, in some sense, resent Cy Hirsch attacking the Post reporters for being, uh, well, like the New York Times before the Iraq War. Uh, and so, but again, we are dependent on the statements of the U.S. officials and the Israeli officials. And, and, and so to us, it's an open question what that is. I believe it's probably a reactor, but it's certainly in the early stages of construction. I mean, there's no... What's the date of this photo? This is August 10th, 2007. That date? Yeah. Okay. And then, and actually what, what we, well, this is too complicated. Let me, um, it was quite an exciting week. I mean, we didn't know we had the right site. I mean, we, we you know, we heard it, the Post had confirmed it. We didn't know. But that's the next day, the satellite company got so excited about the publicity that they ordered up a new image. Uh, and this is what we got. So this is the, you know, Post, you know, you can see the place has been leveled. Um, again, it doesn't prove anything, but it certainly shows that Syrians decided to bring down the facility quickly. And then, it, you know, the story continues. We recently got some imagery um, for this is January 9th where they built a new facility on top of it very quickly. We don't know. It's, I don't, it's not a reactor, it can't be. And in fact, there's some unpublished imagery. This is, it's hard to see this, especially in the light, but there's a foundation here. This goes, so November 16th. And then there's this foundation. And it looks like a warehouse foundation. It doesn't look like anything special. Um, but we don't, know, we don't know what the Syrians are doing. They don't allow the International Atomic Energy Agency into. They say it's nothing to do with nuclear. They, they, and, and Cy Hirsch quotes Syrian officials saying different things, missile, chemical. Um, it's a little confusing what's going on. But I think we're, we're looking at it more as, an, as a possible reactor site. And it's troubling. I mean, it's, it looks like there was North Korean assistance of some type. We don't know for sure. We're working on that now. Um, if there was North Korean assistance, then it's unlikely this reactor, or if there was North Korean assistance that was critical, it's unlikely this reactor would ever be finished because the North Koreans are promising in the six party talks not to do this this kind of stuff ever again, and the U.S. is watching that very closely. So, so long as the deal holds, it's much harder for North Korea to sell dual-use technology for a reactor. So anyway, that's, I, I, that, I'm sorry, that's not short, but that was, it's, yeah, Alan, um, you had your hand up. David, I'd like to uh, press you a little more on the, on the military option. I mean, I'm, I'm not a neocon. I was, uh, very opposed to the Iraq war. I, I think the first published article against attacking Iraq in March 98. So um, I'm not a knee-jerk hawk or a neocon. Um, but I'd like to press you on um, your narrative about uh, the past effectiveness of counter-proliferation um, and press you a little bit more on your details where you're a little bit vague about what an attack uh, on Iran could accomplish. So in terms of the past, if you look back uh, at Iraq, we have uh, at least three pieces of data. First of all, 1981 attack on their reactor, which could have produced plutonium for bombs that was taken out by uh, Israel. And 10 years later, Iraq had not uh, reconstituted a program that was yet ready to produce a nuclear weapon. They may have been on the verge of it. Uh, and then there was a second attack, in this case, the Gulf War, which uh, set back uh, the, the bomb program again. And then we have the third piece of data from Iraq, which is the 1990s. Uh, and there you have Iraq not 
reconstituting its nuclear program for the third time, not because it's being prevented from doing so, but because it's being deterred from doing so by the combination of sanctions and you know, potentially the threat of a third uh, attack. So it seems to me that you have some fairly good data about both prevention and deterrence uh, in Iraq. And then you have another piece of data, which is Libya, which uh, by an incredible coincidence in uh, 2003, uh, when we're attacking Iraq, all of a sudden Libya reveals that it has a, a nuclear program and it's willing to come clean, and it is completely come clean. So we have prevention, deterrence, and now compellence. In three ways, um, force and the threat of force have reduced, uh, retarded, or eliminated nuclear weapons programs. Now, that's not to say there aren't that it, it couldn't in other circumstances, and even in these circumstances, have led others to say, well, if we had nukes, then we would be you know, the North Korean sort of argument. But there is some evidence for this. So that would be the general statement. The specific question is vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Um, and, and you make an argument that a lot of folks make, which is, well, we couldn't destroy everything. Um, uh, enough. You couldn't destroy enough. Couldn't it's destroy not everything. everything enough. So my question is, let's, let's get specific, and let's go to, rather than the Israeli strike, which you say would be smaller than a U.S. strike, let's go to a U.S. strike, which aims not at leveling Iran, not at leveling Iran's military infrastructure, but tries to uh, attack uh, targets that we identify as associated with the uranium enrichment program. Okay? And, and anything like the heavy water plant and the uh, uh, research reactor uh, that's under construction. Um, okay, so let's say we were to do that. We're clearly not going to get everything. By definition, some things are underground. We can't hit, even with our bunker busters. Other things we don't know about. So we clearly can't get everything, but we can get a lot. And so my question is, taking the Israeli logic, logic which is that once they've perfected this, they can reconstitute it um, in, in, a, uh, in high <coughs> But before they perfected it, it's, they can't reconstitute it because they hadn't constituted it. And it's much harder to develop something uh, when most of your big facilities would be destroyed and now you have to do everything clandestinely. So I'm trying to pin you down, and something you probably don't want to say, which is how much would we retard their program through a comprehensive set of airstrikes that aimed at the nuclear facilities, not more broadly? Yeah, I disagree with some of the ways you characterized Iraq, but I, I, I think for sake of time, I'll um, skip right to Iran. I, if, I'll, I'll try to work in the Iraq things. Um, what the problem is with what you're saying is, is you don't know what to target. If you leave their infrastructure intact, which is, is at secret sites right now, they're running as far as we know. They were running prior to 2003, could be running soon, they're running now. Iran has been deploying a lot more centrifuges than it had when the suspension started, so we even can guess at the rates. Uh, and they appear to have enough material equipment to make 10,000, let's say, a order of 10,000 centrifuges. And they may have made many of those by now. So the, you don't know where to attack. That's the real problem. You can, as I said, you can knock out Natanz, Iraq, I mean, you can bomb the old centrifuge manufacturing sites. Um, but what is Iran's reaction going to be? I mean, Iran is not Iraq in 1981. And, and we're sitting with many troops in Iraq. And so Iran can retaliate in Iraq. It can also retaliate in Afghanistan. And so you have to ask yourself, what cost are you willing to bear? Now, the Israelis may be willing to let all hell break loose. If but that's not my question. I mean, that, those are exactly the right questions that the National Security Council should be asking and the President should be asking of the Pentagon. My question is very specific about the effect on the Iranian nuclear program. If, if, if in fact, even Israel says that today, with no attacks, Iran won't have a bomb for three years, then clearly, with attacks, it's going to be longer. And, I, and I'm Maybe it's four years. To me, but, yeah. but the logic to me says no. Well, and this, hmm. I don't want to dominate the conversation, but the logic to me says if you've taken out the facility that has 3,000, and you've taken out the facility that has 1,000, and now they have to try and reconstitute this with half of their factories broken, and they have to make the factory before they can make the centrifuge, hmm. make the centrifuge before they can make the cascade, make the cascade before they can enrich the uranium, it seems to me you've stretched it out considerably. Well, but the lesson of Iraq is that if you stretch it out in 
enough, it may never happen. Yeah, but, it, but you're looking at one possible scenario of what Iran's been doing. There's another, which is that they have several thousand centrifuges already made. Hidden somewhere. Well, not even hidden. They don't have to declare them. They're, they're stored quite legitimately. They don't have to tell the inspectors. And so you could have a situation, just like with the uranium hexafluoride, they have more you know, enough for, you can do the math, you know, over 30 nuclear weapons worth of natural uranium hexafluoride. And so um, they may be able to reconstitute quickly. And if you make them mad, they may launch a Manhattan-style project to get to the bomb quicker. So that's really that's why it's a problem is, one, you don't know what you're taking out. And you don't know what they're going to do. And in the worst case, it could actually speed them up. And so that's why you have to worry. And, 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 if, and this map just, and this is just part of it. I mean, it's not even all of it. You can see there's facilities. There, this, again, this was a centrifuge manufacturing site someplace over here. We didn't pinpoint it exactly. But you can see it's, it's on that side of the country. And, uh, and, and these, so these, let's say, the equivalent of the, well, not far enough. But anyway, the three that were down there in that one, we have no idea where they are now. And, uh, and so, and we don't know where they store centrifuge components in an emergency. Um, so I think you, you're in a position where it's not, you don't get a net, you don't get an, um, a guaranteed delay. You may get a speed up. And, and that's very worrisome. If, and Admiral Fallon, um, um, who's head of Central Command, I mean, he put it pretty well. He said you're going to have to attack the whole country to be able to really. Um, On the record, that I don't support. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't know who was. Uh, could you speak to the release of the National Intelligence Estimate Summary? Uh, it seems that there were a number of very surprised faces, and the press seems to have been a little bit imprecise in characterizing who authorized the release. Did it follow the standard process of classification? It just seems a little bit imprecise. Yeah, and in some of this I'm forgetting. I apologize. The intelligence community, I think, felt the thing should be kept secret, period. And I think the director of intelligence, McDonald, had testified to that effect. Um, and then there, it must have been Bush who made the decision to release it. It would have to be very high up. I don't know who advised him. Um, but it'd have to be at, some, at a level like that. And I, and I think one thing I saw afterward um, was they th in the administration, they thought this part that said Iran had a nuclear weapons program prior to 2003 would be the news, much more than it was. I don't think they, I don't think they fully expected the, the backlash that they got. Um, I don't think they were particularly, they didn't handle the situation particularly well. Um, but normally, when there is a summary like that, there are a number of institutions that look very carefully at yeah. the wording of the summary. And my sense is that these institutions seem to have been pretty surprised. Yeah, I think they were. But I think, you know, there, there's on the, you know, again, I, I, I wish I could remember a little more. Because I, I, um, I had to give a keynote address, a, I guess, an after-dinner speech to one of the, it's called the Intelligence Science Board. And there were many, several top-level officials there who were quite dismayed at how it had played out. This, so this was around you know, December 10th or so when I gave the talk. And they were very dismayed um, that the, um, how, the one, that it had come out, and two, that, it, that uh, the release of it wasn't handled. Now, the writing of it has been criticized. I mean, even reversing some of the sentence order could have changed the, the impact. Because I, I think I've given a fairly honest r summary of the NIE, and I don't think it's a positive assessment of the situation. I think we have a lot to worry about. Um, and the U.S. made a mistake, but the world forgave the U.S. for that a long time ago and was ignoring it on this post-2003 <laughs> ongoing parallel program. Um, I assume it has to be someone like Bush that would have had to do it. I mean, if McConnell, let's say, again, I don't know for sure, but let's say McConnell doesn't want it to come out, who can override McConnell other than Bush? So again, I don't know, you know, who whose voice was the loudest. David, didn't Congress commission it? Yeah, but they didn't, they didn't say it had to be made public. 
Now, everyone, every journalist in Washington was waiting for it to go to Congress and expecting to get all kinds of leaks. And that, that also was a factor, that the thing was going to leak out, um, and, and it would leak out at the pace and choice of somebody who may be an enemy of the intelligence community or of the administration. So I think, it, I think they couldn't, probably couldn't go with this idea that it, nothing was released publicly and decided to get on top of it. But it wasn't handled very well. And it, it hurt us. I mean, I, I mean, you know, our, our, my, our views at ISIS is, I didn't talk about the sanctions, but we'd like to, in fact, what you're talking about, ramp up the sanctions as an alternative to military action and isolate Iran more. They're much more vulnerable than South Africa was. And the South African sanctions created a tax on that economy that, that was part of the reason to, to drop apartheid and, and the nuclear weapons program. So I think you can do it. It's not quick. But it, the sanction effort is severely hurt right now. Okay, time for one last question. Okay. You, know, you were waiting quite a while. There was a news report in November that Ahmadinejad had announced that they had enriched some uranium to a modest level. Mm -hmm. And uh, incoherently to me, he said he was going to be using it in their heavy water reactor. Right. Now, the question is, is Iran also taking a second track to try to develop plutonium using a heavy water reactor, for example, and using the Russian-provided material as a smokescreen by saying, we've, we've got the reactor, we've got the fuel from Russia, we're keeping our hands off of it, we're not doing anything naughty, we're good guys. But at the same time, everyone's looking at the cascade for uranium, they may be ignoring the second track of development. Well, the, I didn't talk about it, but you know, there there are, there is a second track. I mean, you know, this is this is a heavy water reactor, but it uses natural uranium fuel. Right. They there are reports out of Iran by senior officials, some from the nuclear establishment. They want to build a 300 megawatt electric heavy water reactor that would use enriched uranium. I mean, I, I don't understand it. We can never pin it down. And, um, and I tend to read those things as they're, it's just excuses. They need, they need a justification for Natanz. Um, and, the, and that they, Bushir isn't working very well. Right, but the only logic would be that they're trying to develop plutonium. Well, but they are. I mean, at Iraq, they are developing it. And that, and that, uh, and that this, this is on a slower schedule than Natanz. Uh, and there may be some problems. I mean, again, this, they've depended on foreign supply, and it, it's, doesn't, it does, it's, not always a, it's not always steady. I mean, you can have interruptions, and that delays you. Um, but they, they do plan. Now, what Iran has said is they don't ever intend to reprocess. But they've made some procurements that are suspicious, and they talk about separating long-lived radionuclides, which it's hard, you know, it's, quite, it, it's difficult to understand what they mean by that, whether they're talking about plutonium. Or, or you know, what is long lived? I mean, I, it's hard to think of what most you know, that you would be separating long lived radionuclides. Um, five, is that five years or twenty thousand years? I mean, it's really confusing. Um, but the suspension includes no reprocessing, and and that Iran stop this, stop the heavy water reactor. So it's it's a European definition of a of a fissile material cutoff. And so they include this reactor, but not Bushir. So it's a political, it's a political definition. Uh, David, I was told a long time ago that a sign of a good talk is that when you're wrapping it up, there are still people who want to ask oh. questions. Oh. Uh, by that measure, you've been a tremendous success. Well, thank you. Everybody join me. Thank oh. you, David Albright.